Let's bow our heads together as we go to the Word of God this morning. Father, we thank you that we are able to be here in a warm place and to discover you in a fresh way in our worship and in our prayer, in our giving. And now as we go to your Word, we pray that your Word would open things up for us, help us to see you as we've never seen you before. In Jesus' name, amen. At the end of his introduction to the story of Jesus, John reminds us of the one most impossible thing in our world, the impossibility of seeing God. It says in John 1, 18, the first part of the verse, no one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse. You may have heard that just this past week that uh, one of Einstein's predictions came true in scientific reality. People found actually saw for the first time ripples in gravity. What does that mean? I have no idea. I was told simply that two black holes collided and then that made a, a splash in the universe. Uh, not a light splash, but a gravity splash. So we are inquisitive people. We want to find things out about our world and we want to see things that no one's ever seen before. But John says there's one, one being you will never see. And that's the message of the Bible from beginning to end. No one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse. However, people have certainly not given up trying to see God. On the Exodus story, when Moses came to Mount Sinai, he begged God not to abandon Israel in the desert after they had created their own God out of, a, uh, out of gold, made a golden calf, and called it the Lord. That's how desperately they wanted to see God. They said, wait, this isn't working for us. We're, we're following this God. We're praying to this God. We're going to sacrifice to this God. We're going to obey this God. And we can't see him. Everybody else has a God you can see. So the minute Moses was up on the mountain, his brother Aaron, who was the priest and was supposed to be in charge, uh, he oversaw a production of a God picture, a golden calf. And so when Moses came back and he brought some reality to the situation, then he came face to face with the fact that the people had so deeply offended and abandoned the true God that they were in, at risk of having God abandon them. And he says, don't leave us out here. He said, he said to the Lord, I beg you that your presence go with us. Now the Hebrew word for presence that's translated presence is literally the word face. And so what Moses was saying is, don't take your face away from us. Even if we can't see you, don't take your face, your presence, away from us. And when God agreed to remain present with his people, Moses then asked for something else. He sort of had things going to roll here, and he thought, well, this is my chance. And we read in Exodus 30, 33, verse 18, Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. You promised you'd stay? You promised that your presence, your face, would always shine on us. Can I just have a, just a peek? Show me your glory. And the response that God gave him was this. The Lord said, I'll show you my goodness. But as to the desire to see God's glory, verse 20, God says, but you cannot see my face. Remember, face means presence. You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Now, it's not that God wants to remain secretive. God doesn't have some sort of complex whereby, you know, he can't let anybody see who he is. Uh, it isn't that God is just capricious and wants to smite people because they might try to get too close to him. The reason we can't see God is that we would never survive the encounter. I mean, think about what we know about the universe. If two black holes <laughs> which are beyond our comprehension, can bump into each other and can ripple gravity. Think about how much energy it represents. And that's just a little thing going on in a little corner of a little galaxy. Imagine the God who created all things. Do we really think we could sort of walk into that space and just sort of say, hi, how are you? We, God said, you just can't handle the magnitude of my power, of my glory, of my splendor, of my might. No one can see my face. In other words, be in my presence that completely and live. For instance, 
When you go for a walk on a nice, warm, sunny day, there are all sorts of things to look at, and there is one thing you should never look at. Guess what that is? The sun. Not a good idea. If you look at the sun for 100 seconds, you will have, by then, done permanent damage to your eye. Now, of course, the problem with trying to look at the sun for 100 seconds is it is so painful, most people don't quite get that far. Usually, people damage their eyes during an eclipse uh, because the, the sun isn't as bright or doesn't seem to be as bright. Certainly, it's partially masked, and yet our eyes open up for the darker conditions, and in comes all of this ultraviolet light. It burns the outside of our eye. It burns our retina. And uh, people have damaged their eyes, permanent blind spots for 30 seconds of taking a dare and staring at the sun. So the sun is there. It's all around us. We see its light. But we really can't go there. We really can't hang out with the sun and penetrate all of its mysteries. We can look at it for a brief second, but we can never really see it in all its glory and power. We'll never be able to send astronauts to explore its surface. Uh, no one's ever landed a, any kind of a, of a satellite or, or probe on the surface of the sun and had it last long enough to say how hot it was. We have to be content with the view from 93 million miles away on a cloudless day. So does that mean that if we make that comparison to God, that God is always going to be 93 million miles away? We're aware that he must exist because the universe, the creation, the, ourselves point to an intelligent creator. We're aware that we have a moral conscience and that seems to be something that people have across all cultures and uh, a desire to see things be right. We, we have that sense of God. Sometimes we hear a whisper of his voice or maybe we sense the presence of his spirit. But are we going to be sort of like Moses saying, but show me your glory and God says you can't see my face. Is God always going to be that 93 million miles away running the universe? But we're essentially here on our own with a longing to truly know him, but no way to get any closer. Well, John's story of Jesus, his gospel, answers that question for us. Let me read you all of John chapter 1, verse 18, because I only read you the first part. It is true that no one has ever seen God at any time. Yet the divine and only Son, who lives in the closest intimacy with the Father, has made him known. John begins his story of Jesus, his gospel, by retelling the creation story. And you read the very first words in the gospel of John, they sound just like the first words in the book of Genesis, in the beginning. And he begins there to show us how Jesus as God's Son, from before all time, before the creation of the world, how Jesus is part of what it means to be God. He refers to Jesus as the Word through whom all things were created. Well, we know in the creation story, God created by speaking. And now John says, well, just as God's Word came forth from him, really there was more going on than just God speaking from a lonely perspective, but God, Father, and Son were present creating this world. John then, very quickly, moves on from the creation story to the Exodus story, and he tells a new Exodus story centered on seeing the splendor of God. Remember we talked a moment ago about how Moses was on this Exodus journey, far away from everything familiar, encountering this strange, unseen God, and there he is in the middle of the desert on top of a mountain saying, show me your glory, I just I, be my whole reality, let me in. See, on that journey, God had come to make a home with his people out there in the desert. But his splendor and his glory were always veiled by a cloud, a cloud on the mountain. The cloud that led the people was a picture of God's glory being present, but you really couldn't see it. His dwelling there on earth was in a tent sanctuary called the tabernacle that he ordered the people to create for him. But it, his presence was, was to be centered in the room you couldn't go into, the Holy of Holies. Only one person at one time a year could go in there. Now John says, we're on a new exodus. We have a new tabernacle, a new tent, and that tent is the place where God has come to dwell. But this time it's not a tent that we that has stakes and ropes and, and poles and, and curtains. 
the tent is a person, Jesus. And he's here with us, bringing God in a much more immediate way, answering Moses' heartfelt question, show me your glory. In John 1, verse 14, John makes the connections between what it meant for Jesus to come and that old Exodus story. He says, so the word of God became a human being and lived among us. Now that word lived among us literally means tented with us. It's the word from which we get, if you know, some of you have studied the Old Testament, you may have heard of the term the Shekinah glory of God, the dwelling glory of God. It's from that same word. The word of God became a human being, Jesus, and lived, tented among us. We saw his splendor or glory, the splendor as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. No longer, you see, John says, is God's glory or his splendor hidden by a cloud or confined confined to the innermost room uh, in a tent sanctuary. God has now come to live with humans in a face-to-face relationship. Something Moses could only hear John said, we could see. John says, we saw his splendor. We saw his glory. Now, when Moses had asked to see God's glory, the Lord had specifically told Moses, you can't see my face and live. That full expression of who I am, that full intimacy with me, you can't have that and live. Humans can't do that. But now, John says, the impossible thing has happened. Moses could hear God speak. God speaking his name over him and God describing who he is. And of course, that's what we would hope from the God who sends forth his word. But now, John says, something amazing has happened. Something impossible has happened. The word has become one of us. The words become a person. He says, we have seen the glorious splendor of God the glory that had always been too bright, too strong, too pure for humans to look at face to face. The one true creator has become one of us, has become flesh. And let us see, not just hear about, but let us actually see the unseen God. In a letter to fellow Christians, John writes this, 1 John chapter 1, again, he's beginning his letter, verses 1 and 2. From the very first day, we were there taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears. We saw it with our own eyes. We verified it with our own hands. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you in most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. So what does God look like when he appears as one of us? Well, John tells us, going back to verse 14, chapter 1, verse 14, the word became a human being and lived among us. We saw his splendor, the splendor of the Father's only Son. And what did it look like? He was full of grace and truth. Now, once again, we need to go back to Moses and his request to see God to unpack what John is presenting us with here. When Moses encountered God in his glory, remember God said, I'll show you my goodness, but you can't see my face. Well, as the story continues in Exodus chapter 34, God says, you come up to the mountain. And when he got up on top of the mountain, there was a a crack in the rocks, a cleft in the rocks. And we read that God pushed Moses into the crack in the rocks so that he was huddled. And then God passed by. He said, you'll see my back, you won't see my face. You're going to have it all that you can handle of my presence. But when God came by, here is what God revealed to Moses. This is what God, shall we say, sounded like as God described himself in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth 
generation. There are basically two things that were happening there as God spoke his name and revealed himself and allowed a human being to know him as intimately as possible at that moment. That God is filled with love and God is always true and faithful. God is filled with compassion and love and God is filled with forgiveness when we turn our hearts to him. But God never changes, <laughs> never changes reality uh, simply to, uh, to create a false world. God always is true to what is right and what is real. John picks that up in, the, in his gospel when he says, when we saw the word made flesh, he was full of grace and truth. And commentators tell us that those two words, grace and truth, were the appropriate translation for those two aspects of God that we see in Exodus chapter 34 when God revealed himself to Moses. Grace filled with compassion, that giving love that is greater than, that would bring Jesus himself to the cross. And yet truth, always faithful and true to what he had promised, always true to what is right, always just and holy. John tells us that when this one God became one of us, what John and the other disciples saw was what Moses heard, that love and faithfulness in action right to the point of Jesus dying for us on the cross. The splendor of God was nothing less than the splendor of grace and truth. It was God's deepest character in action. You know, it's one thing to see a person, I don't know, maybe you watching TV or you're online and you see a picture of someone who's, who's famous, let's say. And you look at them and, and you say, oh, I know who that is. But of course you know, I have no idea who that is. I, sometimes I'll look at a picture of someone and I'll think, I wonder what that person's like to actually be around. I wonder if they're a nice person. Oh, they look nice in that picture. But I wonder what it would be like to, you know, be part of their household or to work next to them and, Sometimes you read a story and you find out that the person that you thought was so great, nobody can stand being around them because their character doesn't go along with the pretty face or the handsome appearance. John says the real revelation of God was not simply to see fireworks in the sky or to see a light brighter than it ever blazed before. The real revelation was to see right down into God's heart See what he's made of. See how he functions. See what his character is. Isn't that true for each of us? The real person we are is not what we wear on our face. The real person we are is the person that our loved ones hopefully get to know uh, when we're under stress, how we respond. When we're offended, how we forgive. When we're tempted, whether we're true or not. John said, we saw God's glory. And what we saw was the character of God, not just the fireworks of God. Now, it's utterly impossible for us, as I said earlier in the message, to really see the sun. Even our most sophisticated satellites and telescopes can just begin to probe some of its secrets. But that doesn't mean that we don't experience its splendor and its power. God gave us eyes precisely tuned to see the light that comes from the sun. Now, if you know anything about science or physics, you know that we see a very small bandwidth of the light that comes from the sun. It's sending out all kinds of energy, some of it deadly to us if we didn't have an atmosphere and a magnetic field around our planet. But our eyes are tuned specifically to sunlight. All those colors you see in the rainbow. And that, in that little wedge of energy, we can see the sun, experience it. We can turn off the lights in the morning and see that the world has lit up again. We can look out over New York State at the end of the day and watch the sun go down in a blaze of glory. We can't touch the sun's surface, but we can see its image in its light. So seeing the sun is, first of all, impossible if you want to take it to the nth degree to know everything about it, to go inside it and dig around and see what's going on. But on the other hand, it's something we do every day. Jesus described himself 
as the light coming into the world. And isn't that something like the sunlight that races across 93 million miles to arrive here eight minutes after it was on the surface of the sun and light up our world for us? When you're looking at the sun or looking at the light out the windows there and see that sunlight, that light that you're seeing eight minutes ago, eight minutes, not that long, was in the sun. It's part of the sun that has been flung all the way out here. Now that light isn't like sunlight. It isn't some creation of some other thing in the universe. That is the sun reaching out all the way to us in a steady stream of energy coming to us. And you see, that's what Jesus is for us. God himself, the great creator of, of all things, in his absolute completeness, is like the sun. We can't get that close to him. We couldn't survive the encounter. We wouldn't have the bandwidth in our brains to even begin to understand what's going on. We need to be very humble about that reality. The more science discovers, uh, then the bigger God has to be. But what if God were to send himself in our bandwidth? Just the way the sun sends a whole lot of energy out there, but some of it is what we call visible light. And that little band of visible light lights up our world and makes everything possible from plants growing to our being able to walk down the street. What if Jesus came in just the right bandwidth from God so that we could not just see, learn about God, but we could actually see God as much as human beings could experience him? John says that's what happened when we met Jesus. The light from that unapproachable sun, if you will, came into our world. That's why he could write, once again, John chapter 1, 17 and 18, for while the law was given by Moses, see there, now we're back on that mountain where Moses wants to see the glory but can only hear. But love and truth, grace and truth, came through Jesus Christ. It's true that no one has ever seen God at any time. Yet the divine and only Son who lives in the closest intimacy with the Father has made him known. The people of John's day wanted nothing more than to see the glory and splendor of God. They lived in that hope. They read their Bibles and they read these stories about how great God was and is and how he rescued his people and did this thing and that thing and they looked at their enemies and they said someday God's gonna come and smite all of these enemies and we're going to be on the top of the pile. Hadn't the ancient promise, prophets promised that one day God would unveil himself and display his full power to rescue his people? One example would be in Psalm 102. Just two verses, 15 and 16. The nations will fear the name of the Lord. All the kings of the earth will revere your glory. Now bow before your splendor. For the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory. This is just one example of verses you could find from one end of the Bible to the other. People were saying, like Moses, show us your glory. Show us your glory. We're in this place where things aren't working. We're in this place where injustice rules. We're in this place where death creeps into our homes. We're in this place always of need. Show us your glory. We're like our ancestors. We're doing that desert journey and the desert seems to go forever. Show us your glory. And the prophet said someday he would show his glory. Wouldn't that mean that God would then come blasting in, destroy Israel's enemies and make the whole earth cringe? before his splendor and power. But when the Lord did come, he caused not a raging firestorm of judgment to be unleashed on the earth, but instead he did in the lives of people what he said to Moses. He revealed his goodness and his truth, his grace and truth. He let his grace and his truth, he let the deepest parts of his character become visible both in words and in actions here in this world. His true glory was there for those with eyes to see because he came to walk our journeys with us. He paused to experience time and loss, hunger and thirst. He even allowed his own life to be ripped away from him on an awful cross. The word became a human being and lived among us. 
We saw his splendor, the splendor as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. You see, when you see Jesus, you see God. Seeing Jesus is like seeing the Son. There may be a place in your life right now where, like Moses, there's a cry deep inside of you saying, God, I need you. I need whatever it is you can do. Show me your glory. If you're like me, perhaps uh, you can think of how that could happen how that could get fixed. When I've got more bills than money, the fix is more money. When I've got lack of health and I need health, it's like, well, God, you can fix that. Just make this pain go away. Uh, When things aren't working with somebody else and, and they have wronged me, I would like God to show his glory on my behalf. Thank God he doesn't do it. Because there must be at least 10 other people who are, would be praying the same thing because of what I've done to them. And none of us would be left. What we're going to see in the Gospel of John, and you're going to see this over the next six weeks, over and over again, is that Jesus did come and walk out and live out the goodness, the grace, and the truth of God. And that is the greatest glory you can ever see. So on this Valentine's Day, if you are blessed to have a loved one to celebrate with, and maybe you've been with that person for a long time, by now you have come to know that it's more than a handsome or pretty face that makes a relationship. It's that mysterious seeing what can't be seen, isn't it? Of that character and of that love and of that patience and of that thoughtfulness and that forgiveness, what John would call the grace and the truth of being with a person made in God's image who is in their own small way showing God's glory. How much more wonderful to know that God himself came, became one of us, not so he could show us a light so bright it would blind us in an instant, but so that we could see God's heart. And that is seeing the Son. We bow our heads together. Our Father, I I pray, if there's anyone here this morning who needs to see you more clearly, who you really are in the midst of their desert, whether they're on the mountain or in the valley, whether they're just longing to know you better or whether they're desperate for some sense that you're even there. I pray, Lord, that you would just help them to have the faith to dare to trust that not only are you here for us, but you've been here all along. You came as one of us. He who has seen me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. You're here through... Jesus' Spirit drawing us all to see the face of God, the grace and the truth in our Lord Jesus. Lord, help us be able to find your glory in what seem like inglorious ways. Right there in the midst of the things going on in our lives. Help us, Lord, to see that you've already given us the power to see you.